Church music has been part of my life quite literally since the day I was born. My mom was playing piano for a funeral while also being in early stages of labor with me. And I don't think God could have planned it any other way. I began my entry into the world listening to church music and three plus decades later, I haven't stopped. My mom is a very insightful church musician. In her mind, every song has a purpose. Every hymn, every anthem, every everything. And it means a lot to her when people appreciate not just the sound of the notes, but also, more importantly, the messages being conveyed in the lyrics. And sometimes we get so caught up in the former that we lose sight of the latter. Now, I haven't read the entire Bible, but I'm always amazed at how much scripture I wasn't aware that I already knew because I heard it somewhere in church music. And some of you might be familiar with this chorus. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Well, when you look in the hymnal, you'll see that many of the songs will list the person who wrote the lyrics, the person who wrote the music, and then also the passage of scripture from which the lyrics were inspired. Well, the song, Here I Am, Lord, was inspired by Isaiah chapter 6. And the prophet Isaiah talks about being visited by a group of angels. And they're calling out to one another saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Well, that sounds familiar too, doesn't it? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Well, then Isaiah hears the voice of God saying, Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And Isaiah replies, Here I am, Lord. Send me. Well, the Bible is full of examples very similar to this. And today we're going to dive a little bit deeper into 1 Samuel chapter 3. And to give you some backstory, Samuel is a young boy, probably no older than 12. And his mother has set him up with an apprenticeship where he will learn under the tutelage of a priest named Eli. Well, due to the significant age gap, Eli becomes both a mentor and grandfather figure for Samuel. Well, late one night, God calls out to Samuel, but Samuel doesn't know it's God. He just hears his name being called and he assumes the voice must be Eli. So he comes waltzing into Eli's room and he says, here I am. You called me? Well, very tired, Eli says, no, no, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Well, if Samuel was from the Midwest, this would be the moment for him to say, oh, sorry. Well, Samuel goes back to bed, but a little while later, he hears the same voice calling his name. Well, again, he thinks it's Eli, so he comes waltzing back into Eli's bedroom and says, here I am. You called me? Well, very tired and now somewhat annoyed, Eli says, no, I didn't call you. Please, child, please go back to bed. Oh, sorry. Well, Samuel goes back to bed, but sure enough, God continues to call out for him. And darned if Samuel doesn't come in and wake Eli up a third time. Don't you love the Lord's sense of humor? Well, after all of these interruptions of sleep, Eli realizes that it must be God calling. So he tells Samuel, go back to bed, and if you hear the voice again, I want you to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Well, Samuel goes back to bed, and a few moments later, God calls a fourth time. Well, following Eli's instruction, Samuel replies, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And remember that chorus from earlier? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I've heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord. If you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. Well, some of the experiences of characters that we read about in the Bible and sing about in the hymnal mirror the experiences of characters that we read about in our American history books. And today we're gonna to examine the lives of two great American heroes. 
both of whom answered God's call in their time, much the same way that Samuel did in his. Araminta Ross was born a slave in Dorchester County, Maryland, sometime in the early 1820s. And one day in her adolescent years, she was sent on an errand to a dry goods store. And while she was there, she encountered a fugitive slave who had left his master's plantation without permission. Well, when the overseer came upon them, he ordered Minty, as she was known then, to help restrain the fugitive. In a manner that would become a cornerstone of her life, she defiantly refused. Well, the overseer picked up a two pound weight from the counter and he threw it at the runaway slave. Well, he was a little off target, so what was supposed to hit the runaway slave instead hit Minty Ross in the head, cracking her skull. Well, she survived the blow, but for the rest of her life, she experienced chronic migraines, epilepsy, narcolepsy, and what a less believing world might call hallucinations. And I say that about the last part because Minty did not feel that these were hallucinations. She felt that these visions were actually God speaking directly to her, telling her to escape and ultimately to lead others to freedom. I remember our study of 1 Samuel chapter 3, speak Lord for your servant is listening. Well in 1849 she answered God's call, leaving on her own, escaping her plantation in Dorchester County, Maryland, and traveling 150 miles north to freedom. You see, Minty Ross believed that there was one of two things she had a right to, liberty or death. And if she could not have one, she would have the other. Well, crossing over the state line into Pennsylvania, she said, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. And there was such a glory over everything. The sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields. I felt like I was in heaven. Well, after arriving in Philadelphia, Minty Ross changed her name to Harriet Tubman. Well, this new life of freedom was great for Harriet until it wasn't. Everything changed for her when Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. This law required citizens of free states to cooperate in capturing escaped slaves and returning them to their masters. In other words, just making it north of the Mason-Dixon line wasn't good enough for runaway slaves anymore. The only way for them to be truly safe was to get outside the jurisdiction of the United States, which meant traveling even further north to Canada. Now, Harriet Tubman could have chosen to advance north to Canada and live out the rest of her days peacefully as a free woman, but she knew God had a bigger purpose for her life. So over the next 10 years, Harriet made 19 missions back to Maryland to rescue her family and others living in slavery. She famously said, I was a conductor of the Underground Railroad, and I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. Well, taking her missions very seriously, Harriet armed herself with a pistol. Now, if you think that the reason she carried that pistol was for protection against the slave catchers, you'd be halfway correct. The other half of the reason was to make sure that none of her fellow fugitives got second thoughts about their escape. Because you figure each trip was a grueling journey, and when the slaves would grow tired and think about giving up and going back to the plantation, Harriet encouraged them to keep pressing onward to freedom. Well, if the slaves continued to give her any guff, this sassy little lady would draw her sidearm. I said, get back in line. Yes, ma'am. Well, Harriet's rise to leadership in the Underground Railroad earned her the nickname Moses. as a nod to the Bible character who led his people out of slavery in Egypt. And that reference is fairly obvious, but I would argue that you could have called her Samuel as well. Do these words not make you think of Harriet Tubman? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I've heard you calling in the night 
I will go, Lord, if you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. Well, when the Civil War broke out, Harriet joined the Union Army, and she initially served as a cook and a nurse, but if we've learned anything about her life, it's that no matter what work Harriet was doing at any given time, God always seemed to have an even larger mission for her to accomplish next. We, as the Union Army was waging war in the South Carolina Low Country, they started looking around thinking, hmm, we really need somebody who has experience maneuvering covertly through marshes and rivers. Hmm. Now, this swampy terrain of the South Carolina Low Country, well, call me crazy, but I think it closely resembles the eastern shore of Maryland. Well, what if there was somebody who not only grew up in that area, but also had experience leading groups of people undetected through enemy territory? Hmm. Ding, 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 ding. Harriet Tubman's highly transferable skills made her an excellent scout and spy. She did reconnaissance, mapping out the terrain and providing key intelligence about people living in the area. Well, in June 1863, she became the first woman to lead an armed assault during the Civil War. In the 2019 Hollywood film about Harriet's life, it depicts this raid. Giving a pep talk to the all-black 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, she says, suppose there's a snake coiled at your feet and it shoots up to bite you. Well, folks get scared and send for a doctor to cut out the bite, but the snake, he rolls up there and while the doctor's cutting, he bites you again in a new place this time. Well, finally, you realize the snake isn't going to stop until someone kills it. Slavery is still alive. And those rice fields downriver are feeding rebel troops with the toil of a thousand slaves still in bondage. Our mission is to free those slaves. We've waited years to be allowed to fight in this war against our own enslavement, and it will not be one without us. Now is our time. Are you ready to kill the snake? Ooh. History records that three Union steamboats moved safely down the Kumbu River. And I put emphasis on the word safely because somebody <coughs> did her homework and figured out where the Confederate mines were located. So she'd be able to direct her boats safely around said Confederate mines. Well, when the destination was reached, those Union steamboats pulled up to the shore, and all of a sudden, more than 750 slaves came running. Harriet got them loaded on the boats, and away they went, safely around the mines, and off to a new life of freedom. Incredible. Well, along with Harriet Tubman, we're going to examine another great American hero who also answered God's call with a similar response. Wells Crowther grew up in Nyack, New York, a suburb about 25 miles north of Manhattan. And as a little boy, he watched each week as his father got ready for church. And Wells noticed that his dad kept a small comb and bandana in his right front pocket. Well, many children like to emulate their parents or other adult authority figures, and Wells Crowther was no different. And one day, his father gave him a very special gift when he was six years old. His father gave him a red bandana so that they could each have one to carry to church. But what his father didn't know then was that Wells would carry that red bandana with him every single day for the rest of his life. And that red bandana became something of a personal trademark. Wells was a standout lacrosse player in high school, and even on the playing field, he would have that red bandana tucked somewhere under his uniform. Well, at age 16, again, wanting to be just like his father, Wells joined his dad as a volunteer firefighter, serving as a junior member of the Empire Hook and Ladder Company. And after high school, Wells wanted to play lacrosse at Boston College, where he graduated with honors, earning a degree in economics in 1999. And after college, Wells moved to New York City, taking a job as an equities trader for Sandler, O'Neill, and Partners. And working for this firm, he settled into an office on the 104th floor of the South Tower 
of the World Trade Center. Now, it's not uncommon for young people to earn a college degree in pursuit of a career they thought they wanted, only to realize a few years into said career that it wasn't everything they imagined it to be. So they start dreaming of something new. Well, this was the case for Wells Crowther. He had originally wanted a career in business working on Wall Street. So he got his equities trading job in the World Trade Center. It was in his field of study. He was walking distance from the New York Stock Exchange. It was like a dream come true at first, but there was something missing. Well, one day, Wells calls his father. He says, Dad, I think I want to change my career. Oh? I think I want to be a New York City firefighter. If I have to sit in front of this computer screen for the rest of my life, I'll go crazy. Well, unofficially, that wish came true sooner than expected. On September 11th, 2001, United Airlines Flight 175 was hijacked and crashed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center between floors 77 and 85. Well, within minutes, Wells called his mother from his office on the 104th floor, and he left her a voicemail saying, Mom, this is Wells. I wanted you to know that I'm okay. He then made his way to the sky lobby on the 78th floor, where he found a group of survivors, including a severely burned woman named Ling Yang. And these survivors were searching for some way to escape, and out of nowhere, Ms. Young heard a voice saying, I found the stairs, follow me. The voice was Wells Crowther. Well, carrying another woman on his back, Wells directed this group of survivors to the one functioning stairway. And they followed him down 17 flights of stairs where firefighters were helping people evacuate. Well, Wells dropped off the woman he had been carrying. And remember earlier when I talked about Harriet Tubman having to choose between saving herself by pressing north to Canada versus risking her life by turning back to free others. Well, in this moment on 9-11, Wells Crowther faced a similar choice. He could have continued escaping with the other survivors, but he didn't. Instead, risking his own life, he turned back around and headed back up those 17 flights of stairs so that he could help rescue more people. Well, marching up 17 flights of stairs is a grueling task even in the best of circumstances, let alone in the chaos of a burning building. Well, to protect himself from the smoke, Wells covered his nose and his mouth with a red bandana. Well, when he got back to the sky lobby, he found another group of survivors, including a woman named Judy Ween, who had a broken arm, cracked ribs, and a punctured lung. And according to Ms. Ween, Wells helped by putting out fires and administering first aid. And he then directed this group down the same set of stairs from earlier. Well, just as Wells had done before, once he led this group to safety, he turned around and headed back up the stairs in an effort to help rescue more people. Well, at 9.49 a.m., the South Tower collapsed, taking Wells Crowther's life. Six months later, on March 19th, 2002, Wells' body was uncovered in the rubble. And in both a sad and beautiful way, his body was found lying next to uniformed firefighters. Well, at first, the details of what happened in that approximately 45 minutes between him leaving a voicemail for his mother and his death remained a mystery. But in May 2002, the New York Times published recollections of some of the survivors from the South Tower. Wells family read the article and noticed an account from Judy Ween talking about being saved by a mysterious man in a red bandana. So Wells' mother contacted Judy Ween and Ling Young, who was also mentioned in the article, and she sent the women a picture of Wells asking if they recognized him. Well, sure enough, both women identified him right away. This was the man who saved him. This was him. This was the man in the red bandana. 
Wells Crowther was posthumously named a New York City firefighter. And in those last 45 minutes of his life, I can't help but believe that Wells was saying, speak Lord, for your servant is listening. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I've heard you calling. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. You know, God had bigger plans for Samuel than being Eli's apprentice. God had bigger plans for Harriet Tubman than being a slave. And also bigger plans for her than serving limited roles in the army. God had bigger plans for Wells Crowther than being an equities trader. I think it stands to reason then that God has bigger plans for you as well. But the question is whether you're willing to be receptive to God's bigger plan for your life. When you hear God calling, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? I encourage you to find the strength to be both vulnerable and courageous enough to pray these words. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I've heard you calling. I will go, Lord. If you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. Amen.